Well, hey there, church. Come on, third service, let's go. Hey there. Welcome. We're glad that you are here today. Uh, I didn't know that this guy back here plays the harmonica when he plays the guitar, too. That's something else. I'll have to talk to Caleb about giving him a raise, maybe, or something like that. So. Hey, it's great to see you today. Uh, welcome to March. Uh, a lot of people are going to be remembering the second year birthday of COVID. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm just saying I'm just ignoring that, right? I hope and pray, though, that you and your entire family are doing well. And as we cruise uh, into spring, that new life, new joy, uh, new delight, I pray that all those things will mark your everyday existence, all right? We've got some really cool things on the horizon around here at Crossroads that we want you to know about. You can look in your program today and see what's happening. One thing that we just want to begin to mention, Easter is coming really fast. It's in the mid part of next month. And so why don't you right now begin praying about who you are going to invite, uh, the invitations that you're going to give to people to make sure that they are with you. Easter is a beautiful time. And seriously, it's a, it's a time where most people, when you give them the invitation to come to church with you on Easter, there's a pretty good chance that they're going to say yes to that. So begin thinking right now who you're going to invite to our Easter services. We have actually are going to be adding a few new services to kind of the Crossroads lineup of of Easter services. And so be watching for that, and we want you to get involved and and, and get engaged. Another big thing that we've been talking a little bit about, you're going to hear more about, is the great day of service. A couple of weeks ago, I did a sermon on video, and I kind of announced the great day of service, and we had sign-ups. Y'all, were you here for that day? We had sign-ups in the lobby to sign up for a bunch of things for a great day of service. It's coming up on May the 21st. We want you to get that down in your calendar and uh, just come, and we're going to give you assignments to do some community service here in our local community. And I want to really encourage you to do that as we make an impact around here. There's a whole lot more, and I just, I don't know how else to say it, but beg you, please, please, please stay engaged, stay connected uh, to, uh, to the church family here. I think it's going to be extremely valuable for your life. It's going to be amazing for your family and your children, and I think that that honors God as well. Amen? So you make sure that you are uh, staying involved and engaged. Well, as we jump into our message time today, I want to ask you to grab your Bibles, if you will. I don't know if you have a Bible that kind of looks like this, or, or you can start bringing one. I really want to encourage you to do that. Or you can find it on your phone. That's perfectly fine. But turn with me this morning to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19 is where we're going to hang out a little bit today. Last week, we started this new series in the Gospel of Matthew looking at the times where Jesus challenged his people in his world to follow him. And his challenge to people when he said, follow me, was not to just be a, don't just be a fan of me, but I want you to follow me. I want you to follow me. Write this on your program someplace. Jesus said, follow me 13 times in, in, in the New Testament, all right? 13 times. And let me tell you, two simple words, but one monumental invitation, follow me. Matthew chapter 19 sort of highlights another famous story, but a story that I think that a lot of us in today's world can really relate to. And yet it was one where the outcome was not as favorable as one might imagine, but the reality is, is that we probably can identify with it. So you stay with me today. Matthew chapter 19, find that chapter. Let's jump into this. But before we do that, would you bow your heads? And close your eyes. I want to pray uh, for God to really begin to move in this space right now. Father God, we move into a time of study in your word today. Would you allow all of us to open our hearts and open our minds that we might hear what you have to say to each of us today? And that God, truly, you will keep us all focused on you, our minds alert, our hearts attuned to your word. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, uh, years ago during the great Alaska gold rush, some men went deep into Alaska's interior and they never returned. 
After a great period of time, some other men who were also on that quest to find gold in Alaska, they also traveled deep into the Alaska's interior uh, looking for gold. But as they were looking for gold, they found these two guys, these two original men, they, they found their little cabin. And as they entered their cabin, they found two skeletons sitting at a table surrounded with large quantities of gold on the table all around them. And on that table as well was a note describing their successful hunt for gold, so much so that they had ignored the warnings, the early warnings of the upcoming winter. The more they mined, the more gold they found, and they thought to themselves, they reasoned, we can just wait a little bit longer. Well, as you can imagine, a blizzard came in, and they were trapped, and they soon died of cold and no food. They had found their gold, but they lost their lives. They lost track of their priorities. They almost had it all, but they left this life empty-handed. Matthew chapter 19, if you have your Bibles, verse 16. Let's look at this story. Ready? It says, Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to eternal, enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones, the man inquired. Well, Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of these I have kept, the young man said. The young man said, what do I still lack? And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, what does it say? Come, follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I I don't know if you spent any time in church, growing up in church, hearing preachers, hearing sermons. Maybe you're sort of familiar with this particular story, right? The story of this incredible young man with big dreams about the future, uh, really kind of this young man who, who really kind of was asking questions of Jesus that probably are ones that we can kind of relate to. We understand. We'd, we don't know much about this guy other than he was a rich young ruler, maybe 20, maybe 25, maybe 30 years old, probably not much older than that. But he was a tiger. He was a, a go-getter. He was a man on the way to the top. Think, think the wolf of Wall Street, And although we can't really be sure, I think that perhaps maybe he made his money in real estate, which is one of the best ways to make a lot of money quickly if you know what you're doing, which, by the way, it's also one of the best ways to lose a lot of money if you don't know what you're doing. (laughs) But he knew what he was doing, right? Limited partnerships, condos, syndications, buy low, sell high, turn swamp land into high-rise apartments. He had made a lot of money At a very young age, he had risen to the top of his corporation, yet guess what? He still felt empty. And this was odd because even though he was a rising star, he was also very religious. I mean, the Bible tells us that, that, that he was really kind of with it. If you read between the lines here, he, he believed in God. He believed in God's word. The Ten Commandments were his, were his law. The Ten Commandments were his way of life. Unlike so many people of today, he didn't forget the Almighty on his way up to the top. He, he prayed. He read the Scriptures. He truly tried to do the right thing. He, he was a moral man with a capital M. He, he didn't steal or cheat to get his way to the top. He didn't sleep around either. He was a straight arrow in a crooked world. He was a true believer, a hard worker, a combination that often leads to worldly success, yes, but all of that going on in his life, yet he still felt empty on the inside. Something, man, something was missing. He, he didn't know what that something was, but he knew that he wasn't all that he could be. He knew that the something else was there. And so, as we read this story, one day, he, that young man went to see a, a carpenter from Galilee, a man named Jesus. 
A man who was at the top of his game with all the money that he could want, a man who had it all, he came to Jesus with this penetrating question. What was the question? He said, good teacher, say it with me, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Verse 16, you see, he wanted eternal life, and his, and his heart told him that his money and his religion wasn't enough. This conversation must have made a pretty big impact in the early church because it's not just mentioned once, it's not mentioned twice, it's actually mentioned three times in Matthew and Mark and Luke. Now, let me just say, say this, there's, I think there's a great deal to admire about this young guy. He was obviously a man of good moral character. I, I do not doubt that he obeyed God to the very best of his ability. I think that we should also admire his courage in coming to Jesus. That couldn't have been a very easy thing for him to do, don't you think? I mean, he was a very successful young guy, and, 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 and you know, young bucks on, on their way up the ladder normally wouldn't have time for an itinerant preacher from Galilee. Certainly, though, he's honest admitting his need in fact, in Mark's account of this story, Mark chapter 10, we learn a little interesting fact that says this, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. There's nothing subtle about that, is there? I mean, he, he's aggressive in approaching Jesus, and, and that too fits the picture for his aggressiveness probably was what got him to his spot in life, right? He, he was aggressive in, in trying to figure this out, and that's there, he asks the right question, and he goes to the right person. So those are all good things. And he's saying, Lord, tell me what to do so that I can inherit eternal life, and if you tell me what to do, I will do it. Does this sound a little familiar? Have you, ever, have you ever kind of probed God before, and you're like, God, this is really what I want in my life, and if you'll just tell me what to do, I'm going to do it. If you, you didn't, have you ever bargained with God before? Anybody here? Come on, be honest with me this third serve. Anybody bargain with God? I've bargained with God all the time. I remember when I was a, a little kid, you know, my, 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 my family, we had a really nice fishing pond right behind our house. And I remember fishing for, for catfish one day, one afternoon, it was hot, and does anybody, do, I was fishing for yellow belly catfish. This is not in my notes, by the way. And I remember just, I was dying to catch a fish, and I began to bargain, God, if you just let me catch a big old fat catfish, I'll do this, that, or the other. I'll serve you. I'll become a preacher. <laughs> I didn't catch one that day. But you've bargained with God before? That, that's what was going on here. This, this guy, he, he, he comes and, and he says, Lord, if you just tell me what to do, I will do it. He was a lot like us, and he was a lot like the Jewish people in the first century who believed that if they obeyed the laws and the commandments, that was great, but there was still one thing, one great and good and righteous and virtuous thing, that if they could only find out what that one thing was, and then they would do it, they would be guaranteed entrance into heaven. And that's why this young guy, man, he is on top of the world, and he comes to Jesus, and he kneels before him in the middle of the road. And it is at this point that the story begins to take on this new direction. Because for all of his admirable qualities, the man was, was wrong on two counts. Number one, he was wrong to think. He was wrong to think that there was something he could do that would gain entrance into heaven. And number two, he was wrong to think that if he could do it if he only knew what it was. And so he comes to Jesus with this crucial question. The question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives him an answer that has kind of confounded people for generations, right? They've confused people all over. The question seems simple enough. What must I do to inherit eternal life? But when you read what Jesus says back to him, it's like, what, right? It appears that Jesus doesn't understand the question. Jesus doesn't know the answer to the question, or Jesus just doesn't want to give him a straight answer. Pretty simple question. What must I do? And from our point of view, it doesn't seem as if the, the question and the answer really go together. Here's what Jesus says. Look at the text again. Why do you ask me what is good? There is only one who does good. And so the guy was probably like, that, that, that doesn't make any sense. But before he could reply to that, Jesus plunges forward, right? And he goes on and he says, if you want to enter life, obey the commandments. 
What does he mean? The ten. Commit. Y'all heard of the Ten Commandments before? Yes? Ten Commandments, right? Do not murder, do not commit adultery. These are right here. Verse 18. Do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father, mother, love your neighbor as yourself. There's another part of this story that seems a bit irrelevant to us, right? This, this fellow wants to know how to get to heaven, and in response, Jesus first engages him in what appears to be this abstract theological conversation, and he brings up the Ten Commandments. What's really going on here? What, what's going on here? Here's the deal. The, this first century yuppie, which we don't use that term anymore. You probably haven't heard that term in a long time. This first century yuppie, right, He wants what so many people of this world today want. He wanted a list. You, Jesus, you give me a list. Tell me what to do. I will do it. I need to make sure I will go to heaven. Give me a list, and I'm going to put it on a big whiteboard in my house with little boxes on the side, and when I do that thing, I'm not going to use an erasable marker. I'm going to use a permanent marker. I'm going to mark these things off when that happens. Just give me a list, and I'll do that, and I'll do this, and I'll do this, and I'll do this, and when I get to the bottom of the list, then I'm going to know for sure that I'm going to go to heaven. And so Jesus says, fine, fine, I'll give you a list. Here's my list, the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Why don't you try doing those for a little while? Now notice, notice a little sidebar that he does not quote from the first part of the Ten Commandments. Did you notice that? I, I, you, you surely, the, 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 the Ten Commandments are kind of in two sections. I'm sure you've been taught this before, right? The first part of the Ten Commandments is vertical commandments. It has to do with our relationship uh, with God, all about. He says, you know, have no other gods before me. Have no idols that you worship. Do not take God's name lightly. Honor the Sabbath, right? These commandments all vertically deal with our relationship with God. He doesn't quote those. He quotes the second half of this, right, that, that are horizontal, and they deal with our relationship to the people around us. Honor your mother and father. Honor your parents. Uh, murder, adultery, theft, lying, coveting. Jesus doesn't quote from the first part. He quotes from the second part because he knew that that's where the man had his problem. He says, look, you want a list? Fine. Fine. Here's your list. Keep the Ten Commandments. If you keep the Ten Commandments perfectly, when you get to the end, you're going to be okay. And so evidently, this guy doesn't lap for confidence. He's, here's his reply, verse 20. He says, well, all of those I've kept since I was a little boy. Right? Well, why, why would he make a statement like that? Well, on one level, it was probably true. He hadn't probably literally murdered anybody, probably hadn't literally committed adultery. On a deeper level, we can simply say that he is self-deceived. He is sincere, yet he is sincerely wrong. When, you know, when anybody says, I have perfectly kept the Ten Commandments my whole life and, until now, you automatically know a couple of things about that person. Number one, They probably don't really understand the meaning of the Ten Commandments, (laughs) and they probably really don't have a real clear understanding of themselves. I remember a bunch of years ago, I was doing some surveying, and I walked, going door to door, you know, and I walked up to the store, I knocked on the door, and and the guy came, I said, hey, you know, if God, you know, if you die today, would God let you in, in his perfect heaven? He said, yeah, absolutely. I said, oh, really, you're very sure about that. Why? He said, well, I've never broken one of the Ten Commandments, ever. All ten, I got them all down. I'm like, Okay. (laughs) This young man, he looks good on the outside. He's got it all together. And Jesus is telling him, wait a second, Buster, you're not near as hot as you think you are. You are not near all that. Jesus drops the bombshell, verse 20. What does he say? You still lack one thing. You still lack one thing. That must have floored him, right? It's kind of like saying to a boxer, you're the greatest, you're the greatest 11-round boxer in the whole wide world. You're just not that great because, you know, you get knocked out in the 12th round. <laughs> so you're good for 11 rounds, but you, you're, you're bad the, the, the last round. That's like saying to a painter, you're a really good painter, but you stink with the color blue. You're like, the color blues in your painting are the worst, man. You're, you, listen, when it, when, it, when it comes to going to heaven, it's not what you've got that counts. It's what you lack. What do you suppose this rich young man lacks? I mean, he's got everything, right? 
What, what does he lack? Jesus said something to him that we would never say to somebody else if we were trying to lead them to Christ, right? If he says this, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come what? What does he say? Then come follow me. If you have a Bible like this, would you circle those verbs in your Bible? What does he say? Go, sell, give, come, follow. What, how, would, how would you like that if we made it a requirement for you to be involved at Crossroads for you to do that? You can, you can be a part of our church, but you got to go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then, and then come. Jesus said to this follower, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to, here's what you've got to do. Make a list of this. You've got to go sell everything, give what you have to the poor, and then come follow me. If we said that at Westbrook or Crossroads or Hinthe Onita, man, we'd empty out the pews really fast, wouldn't we? Why? Because that's hard, isn't it? That's hard to do. Let's be honest. Those are really scary words. So let me put this in perspective. Do you realize that this is the only time that Jesus ever said this to anyone as a condition of eternal life? It's the only time. But why did he say it to this earnest young man, this faithful young man? Why did he say it to him? He said it to him because that's where he had this problem. He looked really good on the outside, but on the inside he was totally controlled by something that wasn't God. He was totally controlled by the love of money. And Jesus was saying to this fine-looking, upstanding, good young citizen, if you want to be my follower, you have got to release the stronghold of your life that keeps me from being all that I want to be in your life. You've got to release the stronghold of money in your life. And so you can just kind of translate it to you, right? It may not be the stronghold of money in your life, but Jesus says, if you want to follow me, listen, look up here, you've got to release the stronghold that you have in your life that keeps God from moving into that part in your life that keeps him from being what he wants you to be. Y'all understand? And so for this man, money was not just an object. Money was not just a thing. Money had become his God, and Jesus knew it. Look up here. He is teaching this man at the moment and the point of his need, and he says this. He says, you're going to have to give up your idolatry of money before you can be my disciple. What one thing do you lack, do I lack? Jesus says, you've got you to you release that stronghold. Finally, we come to the, to the most hopeful part of this story, the most hopeful part of this story. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, Matthew tells us that, that when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Mark adds, Mark chapter 10, verse 27, Mark adds that the man's face fell as he walked away. And you're like, Pastor Mont. Why is that the most hopeful part of the story? <laughs> it's the most hopeful part of the story. I think it's the most hopeful part of the story because it was at that point that Jesus' words really hit home. A preacher friend of mine by the name of Ray Pritchard wrote in his sermon this. He, he, he didn't try to argue. He didn't pretend that it didn't matter. I wonder what happened to him later. <laughs> This discussion takes place just a few days before the crucifixion. Did he eventually become a follower of Jesus? We don't know for certain, but I wouldn't be surprised to see him in heaven. As far as I know, this is the only case in the New Testament where somebody came to Jesus and Jesus gave him the truth and let him leave and walk away. What's it say here? It says, this rich young ruler walked away sorrowful, of the translation says, because his wealth held him back. And Jesus said, hey, dude, here's the truth. Let me tell you the truth. This is going to be painful. Let me tell you the truth. Here's the truth. And the guy's like, mm, that's too hard. I can't do it. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to, I, this, this, I'm going to leave there. And, and did you notice that Jesus didn't say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me, let me just lower the price a little bit for you. I don't want you to walk away. Let me, let me go talk to my manager and see if I can get a little bit better deal for you. No, Jesus said, here's the truth, bro. Here's what you got to do. He told him the way it was, and the man walked away. And just so, so we wouldn't miss it, the, uh, 
Jesus then gives us the moral of the story. Here's the moral of the story. Verse 23, how hard is it for a man, a rich man, to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard any preacher try to explain this away by saying that the eye of a needle represents some kind of tiny little passageway in Jerusalem, in the city of Jerusalem that you had to kneel to go into. I don't think it means that at all. <laughs> I think that when he says the eye of a needle, he's thinking about the eye of a needle. Well, you know what I'm talking about, right? Put the little thread through, the eye of a needle, like the eye of the needle you do your sewing with. And when he says camel... I think he means that big old smelly, ugly camel that spits and you ride across the desert on. He says, look at the camel, look at the eye of a needle. It, it's easier to get a big, ugly camel through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get to heaven. Why? Because rich people trust in their riches. Rich people have this stranglehold of this thing called money or possessions or whatever, and that's their idol that they give allegiance to, and, and so they're not going to get it. It's, it's easier for a poor person to get saved because you kind of like, God, if you don't come through for me, man, I'm sunk. <laughs> but a rich person, no, no. A rich person's like, you know, if, if Jesus doesn't come through for me on this one, it's okay. I've got my pension. I've got my stocks and bonds. I've got my options. I've got my golden parachute. I've got my safety net. If he doesn't come through for me, it doesn't really matter. I'm taking care of things myself. Jesus says, you want to be saved. You can't take care of things yourself. Which then leads us to a very logical question, which is what the disciples asked. Verse 25, well, then who can be saved? Who can be saved? And the answer comes in verse 26. What does it say? With man, this is impossible, but with God, with God, all things are possible. Here is the good news of the gospel, my friends. Even rich people can be saved if they give up their trust in their riches and they put their trust in God. The richest person in the world can be saved, but they've got to stop trusting in their riches and they've got to start trusting in Jesus Christ and Him alone. The French philosopher Pascal said that there is a God-shaped vacuum inside of the heart of every person. And if you don't fill that vacuum with God, you're going to fill it with something else. And when you do, you will find out what this rich young man found out long ago. You can have it all, but it's still not enough. Ray Pritchard says this. He says, since nature abhors a vacuum, if you don't fill it with God, you'll fill it with money or career or power or prestige or sex or whatever you think you can find in this world. You will, say it with me, you will what? Not be satisfied. What's the next slide? And it will be said of you, as was said of the rich young ruler, one thing you lack and that one thing, would you read this with me out loud, ready? That one thing being a living, dynamic, life-transforming relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I left out one thing, that little detail that only the, the Apostle Mark writes. Mark chapter 10, verse 21, in his version of the story, he says, he adds that Jesus loved this young man. And that's why he told him to go sell everything and become his disciple. You see, Jesus must have had some kind of connection with him. He, he kind of knew him. He loved this guy. He knew that this young man was earnest and sincere. He knew that he truly wanted eternal life. And he knew that his stranglehold of wealth was holding him back. And he loved him enough to tell him the truth. And he loved him enough to let him walk away. Friends, that's true love. He let him go in the hope that someday he would come back and he would follow him. Which then leads me to a couple of conclusions. And I'm going to be done. You all ready? Take out your outline. I want you to write these, write these down. Three lessons the rich young ruler teaches us today. Here's the first one. No one can inherit heaven on their own merit. Y'all got that? I, I think this is really important for us in, in, in this kind of religious environment that we live in, we grew up in, because a lot of people think, well, if I just kind of do all these things and I go to church on all these days and I, and I say it all right, then I'm going to be okay. Listen, no one can inherit 
heaven on their own merit. We are all so tempted to place our hope and our trust in something or someone other than God. For the rich man in this story, and many of us today, it was money and good deeds. He thought by having enough money and doing good enough, he's going to earn salvation. What good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? But he couldn't, and we can't either. A camel cannot go through an eye of a needle. A snowball cannot survive in hell. And we cannot earn salvation. The only way is through Jesus Christ. It's the only way. He's the only way. John 14, 6. Jesus was trying to get this Yerushalayim ruler to see the dire condition that he existed in. He was trying to show him of his need for a Savior. There was some, simply nothing he could do on his own merit to earn eternal life. Here's the second lesson that the rich young ruler teaches us today. Number two, the only thing that you can worship that will satisfy you is Jesus Christ. Everybody worships something or someone. You, you get to choose what you worship. What we worship will be where we get our identity. It becomes who we are. The problem is, is the things that most people worship do not satisfy. They leave us wanting more. But there's really only one thing that you can worship that will actually satisfy you. This rich man worshiped his wealth and his ability to earn his way. Jesus is showing him that worshiping those things will never get you what you hoped for. Only God will satisfy you. So you got those first two? No one can inherit heaven on their own merit. Number two, the only thing you can worship that will satisfy you is Jesus Christ. Number three, Jesus offers us a better way to live, but it will hurt. Jesus offers us the invitation of a better life, life the way that he intended us to live it, life free from the things that weigh us down. The invitation is free, but the process is sometimes challenging, sometimes painful. Anybody here can relate to that? It's not easy being a Christian. Is it easy for you to be a Christian? Anybody here? I can barely see you, but is it easy for you? If it's easy, if it's easy for you, I want to talk to you because it's hard for me. I mean, it's like devastatingly difficult for me. The invitation is free, but it's sometimes challenging. Hear me on this. Salvation is a free gift that you don't have to do anything but accept it. But Jesus wants more than just to save us. He wants to redeem us. And here's the reason why. Because he loves us and he wants what's best for us. And he knows that that redemption process can be painful. That's what this this guy was being offered by Jesus, a better life. This guy had everything that the world had to offer, and he still felt that something was missing. Jesus offered him a better way, but instead he left sad. Why? Because the pain of going through the redemption process was too great for him. It meant releasing those things that he felt were so important and so valuable it meant releasing those things. Have you ever, have you ever just clung on to something so tight that your, that your hands begin to like cramp up a little bit? Like, I'm not going to let this go, right? I'm not going to let this go. And that process of letting go can sometimes be a really challenging thing, can't it? And at that moment, he just couldn't do it. The same is true for us. Jesus doesn't want to just save us. He wants to give us life and let it be lived to the fullest. And that process can be difficult. It can be painful. But we need to recognize that Jesus is leading us through this process because he cares for us. And let me tell you something. He's going to tell us the truth. He's going to tell us the truth. But let me just remind you that on the other side of that incredible pain can be incredible joy and incredible life. And so when Jesus says, follow me, what that means is you've got to release. Don't be like the rich young ruler. Be like Jesus. Father, you have promised bread for the hungry and rest for the weary. May those who hunger be filled with the bread of life and may the weary find the rest that only Jesus can give. Forgive us for loving other things so much that we have no room for you. Forgive us for loving money so much that we have no room for you. 
Grant that we might realize our deepest need so that you can provide us the one thing we lack. In Jesus we pray.